so i am making a really super super unplanned video about dostoevsky's the brothers karamazov i read this book a while ago um not a while ago last week i finished it i mean i started reading it a while ago it, i started reading it like 2 months ago and uh, the old me would have been able to finish it in like 3 days maybe not maybe not it's quite a complex text but anyway i feel like i procrastinated more than necessary um and uh, i thought i should make a video about it because i was just inspired i was like i don't know people who know me probably know that i binge on youtube like a little bitch <laughs> and i was watching this video about this woman who makes videos on books on youtube and i was really inspired by her videos um so she was talking about like her top 20 favorite classics of last year or whatever and i was like i don't know if i would know how to rank the books that i read by the way i don't read a lot of books although i have a lot of books um and that's not because i'm not a voracious reader but that's because i have a difficulty i have difficulty in concentration that's a whole other issue i did manage to finish this book the brothers karamazov by dostoevsky uh i would take it out but i just fit it back in my bookshelf and uh, that was quite an achievement so i don't think i'm going to risk you know <laughs> just fucking around with my bookshelf but anyway um i thought maybe i should sort of talk about it although i'm not really sure what i want to say because like i said this is very unplanned i don't have any notes i do have some excerpts which sort of made me think um I think maybe I should start with the obvious, which is the chapter called the Grand Inquisitor. Um, spoiler alert for those of you who haven't read the book. I mean, I'm pretty sure you may know about this chapter if you've heard of Dostoevsky, because this is like the chapter that everyone talks about. Like every every time you know you say I'm reading this book, they're like, oh, it's, you know, the one with the Grand Inquisitor. This book. Anyway, even if you don't know about it, even if you don't know about it. Um, So basically the grand inquisitor the chapter is about this man uh one of the characters called Ivan or Ivan uh, okay so it the, the chapter is about Ivan and this conception he has he's it, i think it's like something he's written or thought about and this chapter basically talks about um Christ coming back to life and how do his followers the believers and how does the church deal with that and it's very interesting because um it talks about the desire for people uh, it talks about how or, whether, or rather i should put it differently ivan believes that people don't really believe in god in order for them like he doesn't believe in god he doesn't believe that god acts as a compass for truth or love or compassion but rather he uh, believes that god is 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 like a metaphor or is is uh, an easy um he 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 helps people to um he helps people who want to believe in um you know mysticism or who want to believe that you know that the god is not he actually mentions three things perhaps i should just read them out if only i could know where it is but basically the chapter is about how the that the church is not happy about the fact that christ has come back 15 years after his death because the church basically says that you know when you left us you left us with this belief of um you know you left us believing that you left your believers believing that there is such a thing as courage and there is there is a way for them to be good and true and your expectations from them were too high and you left behind all all of your followers who didn't have that courage and they slowly fell to nihilism and they slowly fell to you know they they felt de- 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 um, dis- they they fell to despair and for them we have created um we have given them a home we have given them hope 
that even if you cannot you know keep your head straight and keep your eyes towards the transcendental towards you know the greatest ideals for human kind even if you keep your eyes on a lower target that that is enough that they have erased in people's minds the uh their interest or their sort of <laughs> what the church has done has focused people on making their current lives uh, as satisfactory as possible so they have in some ways um they have some way in some ways uh, clouded the ideals that christ left behind because they believed that those ideals were too high for a, for for a human to achieve um that that christ you know it, it was like a self defeating prophecy rather so basically this man this uh, clergyman or whatever he believes that you know i would like you to please fuck off <laughs> I shouldn't have said that we're talking about God here but basically he talks about the fact that he is not he's not that the idea of freedom the idea of so I'll okay I'll I'll answer this This is the significance of the first question in the wilderness and this is what though thou hast rejected for the sake of that freedom which thou hast exalted before above everything yet in this question lies hid the secret of the world choosing bread thou would have satisfied the universal and everlasting craving of humanity to find someone to worship so as long as man remains free he strives for nothing so incessantly and so painfully as to find someone to worship but man seeks to worship what is established beyond dispute so that all men would agree at once to worship it for these pitiful creatures are concerned not only to find what one or the other can worship but to find the community of worship is the chief misery of every man individually and of all humanity from the beginning of time for the sake of common worship they've slain each other with the sword they have set up gods and challenged one another put away your gods and come worship ours or we will kill you and your gods so it will be the end of the world even when the gods disappear from the earth they will fall down before the idols just the same you, thou didst know thou couldst but not but have known the fundamental secret of human nature but thou didst reject the one infallible banner which was offered thee to make all men bow down to thee alone the banner of earthly bread and thou hast rejected it for the sake of freedom and the bread of heaven behold what thou didst further and all again in the name of freedom i tell thee that man is tormented by no greater anxiety than to find someone quickly to whom he can hold over that gift of freedom with which the ill-fated creature is born but only one who can appease their conscience can take over their freedom in bread there was offered thee an invincible banner give bread and man will worship thee for nothing is more certain than bread but if someone else gains possession of his conscience oh and then he will cast it away he will cast away thy bread and follow after him who has ensnared his conscience in that thou was right for the secret of man beings man's being is not only to live but to have something to live for without a stable conception of the object of life man would not consent to go on living and would rather destroy himself than remain on earth though he has bread in abundance that is true but what happened instead of taking men's freedom from them thou didst make it greater than ever didst thou forget that man prefers peace and even death to freedom of choice and the knowledge of good and evil nothing is more seductive for man than his freedom of conscience but nothing is greater cause of suffering and behold instead of giving a firm foundation of setting the conscience of man at rest forever thou didst choose that all is exceptional vague and enigmatic that you thou didst choose all that is exceptional big and enigmatic thou didst choose what was utterly beyond the strength of man acting as though thou didst not of them at all thou uh, thou who didst come to give thy life to them for them instead of taking possession of man men's freedom thou didst increased it 
and burdened the spiritual kingdom of mankind with its sufferings forever. Thou didst desire man's free love, that he should follow thee freely, enticed and taken captive by thee. In place of the rigid ancient law, man must hereafter with free heart decide for himself what is good and what is evil, having only thy image before him as his guide. But thou didst not know that he would at last reject even thy image and thy truth, if he is weighed down with the fearful burden of free choice. They will cry aloud at last that the truth is not in thee, for they could not have been left in greater confusion and suffering that thou hast caused, laying upon them so many cares and unanswerable problems. So that in truth thou didst thyself lay the freedom, uh, the foundation for the destruction of thy kingdom, and no one is more to blame for it. Yet what was offered thee? There are three powers, three powers alone, able to conquer and to hold captive forever the conscience of these impotent rebels for their happiness, their forces. Sorry. There are three powers and three powers alone able to conquer and to hold captive forever the conscience of these impotent rebels for their happiness. And those forces are miracle, mystery and authority. Thou has rejected all three and has set the example for doing so. When the wise and the dread spirits set thee on the pinnacle of the temple and said to thee, Okay, I should not go on further than that. So the point, this is a very, very profound, uh, this is a very profound and thought provoking and deep sentiment and idea that uh, the clergyman or the priest, the, I, I assume the Roman Catholic priest um, is posing towards Jesus. Uh, what he's basically saying is that to give man, to set man on the adventure or the journey of finding himself or of building his conscience in order for him to discern right from wrong was the greatest mistake that you ever made because there has not never been as great uh, there has never been greater suffering than in that in that journey and what the church has done is they so this conversation is essentially um the bad so in any religion and this is something i learned from peterson jordan peterson in any religion there is a dogmatic element and then there is the spiritual element so the spiritual element contains all the ideals that humankind must strive for and i think that kind of remains constant throughout all religions because ideals are values and values are limited you know you can't create values um you anyway i don't want to get into that so there is the value aspect of religion and the dogmatic aspect is what is different for all religions um that's the practice and the customs and the traditions of every religion um and so basically what the clergyman is arguing is that people don't have the ability uh to or rather not everyone has the has the strength the courage the uh they don't have what it takes to reach their spiritual uh the ultimate spiritual what do you say consciousness i guess to to reach the heights of their spiritual nature um but what we have done for those of for those people is that we've offered them a dogmatic structure where we tell them what is right and what is wrong and that eases their heart and remember there is this conversation about bread i think those of you who have read the bible or who know something about christianity might know of this phrase which this uh, verse in the bible in the bible where jesus says that man does not live on bread alone so basically he says that by casting away bread you have set their sights on something more transcendental like heavenly bread and once man realizes that uh, the cost of seeking that bread is so high uh, we we the compassionate church we the kind men of you know uh, of of this um, <laughs> of this uh, what do you say whatever this uh, institution we told them that it's okay to choose earthly bread or heavenly bread that there is um, nothing wrong with setting your sights to um, you know to, to 
you know to cast off free will or to cast off freedom in the in if if i'm not go doing a good job of explaining so basically it's it's the conversation is as much about the balance between spirituality and dogma in a religion as much as it is a conversation between uh free will and some kind of destined deterministic uh determinism or one could say freedom and slavery um so what any religion preaches um the spiritual element of any religion what it essentially preaches is that you need to find it in your heart to follow god you know nobody outside of you um should be telling you that this is what god looks like or i am god or you know this is what god said um and actually this is something gandhi also says for those of you who read his reads have read his work or know something about him so he himself said that i'm not going to read a spiritual text and just take it word for word i will use my conscience and use my inner judgment to decide what i feel is right or wrong because uh, a text is who said this somebody said as a double distillation i think one of my professors said this i don't remember but they said that you know these these holy texts they're a double distillation let's act oh, let's let's accept the what um, the hypothesis that these are words of god maybe but there are also words of god translated by a prophet and then there are versions of what the prophet's disciples um understood of what the prophet was saying so there are we we don't know what the purest word of god is we just know translations and interpretations of them so we need to take them with a grain of salt so basically what any what the belief is that the true word of god will always be it will never be in the spirit of dogma or in the spirit of any kind of uh, what's the word it will never be you know um like it won't be an iron fisted uh <laughs> command it would rather be you know a statement upon which you need to contemplate and decide for yourself whether you agree or disagree whether you want to follow or reject so the belief is that although the belief is that religion and god will set you free but what the church has done and what many people argue one of the reasons why people lose faith in god and you on all of that is because they look at the church or any establishment any religious establishment as uh as what's what's the word they see it as um that that is what religion is that they are the meaning of religion however they are just the practitioners of religion and every religious practitioner is as different as their faiths um and even within a common faith there are many kinds of people many shades of beliefs so the point is that um oh my god i've gone on such a tangent i forgot where i began my point is that um basically what he's saying is that you gave man so much free will that man became he suffered rather than you know he suffered because some men don't want to be free they can't be free they don't know what it is to be free they want to be slaves they need an authoritative voice telling them right from wrong they just don't have a chiseled conscience that can you know that can do what you expect of them that this and this is your fault he outrightly says that remember there was this one line that this is your your own you caused the destruction in humanity the reason why people kill each other for faith for 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 the term for uh, the reason people uh, kill each other especially when it when it comes from fun, any kind of fundamentalist belief is because what there is one faith arguing that they are better than the other and that's your fault because you have set such an impossible task for human beings that they have fallen instead to despair rather than hope and for those despairing individuals we have offered a gentle hand and said that we understand that you you don't know what's right but we can tell you and then that's where the dogmatic element of religion becomes really strong and that's where 
the idea of slavery and you know um like i said like a commanding authoritative voice become stronger and that's the argument that this clergyman this priest is making that if we need those people we need people who can sort of shut down this whole conversation of free choice and free will because it's too it's too almost like it's too high minded for the for the average joe you know or india may maybe the average raj i don't know my point is that it's a it's an argument in favor of an authoritative leader of an authoritative voice that doesn't that doesn't appeal to the heart and the conscience of the human being which is which is fickle which is you know it's it's indecisive it's i mean it's at least that's his belief that it's very it's weak you know this is the these are so this is how an authoritative person would look at vulnerability they would look at it as weakness rather than strength because they don't have the strength to be vulnerable and have it you know work in their favor so they are like no i'm going to rule with an iron fist because you know that's effective and that's that keeps people in order also larger conversation between order and chaos the excesses of freedom and uh, what do you say freedom and i guess uh, not slavery but um some kind of structure i i don't even know if anyone's understanding me at this point but i'm still going to continue um and so he also uh, this man he also refers to another section in the bible and those were the three sort of um temptations that satan sets for jesus where he tests jesus's 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 faith where, uh, and one of the temptations was that um you need to here is a mountain here is a cliff fall off of it if your god truly loves you while you're falling while you're free falling you won't die like if you have faith in your god you know like how people even people want to mock god that's what they say right that oh you just you fucking you mistake you don't know what you're talking about you you believe in abstract and silly things and whatever so jesus um actually uh, knows how to uh, uh sidestep that temptation by saying that you know uh, my faith isn't uh, determined by um, my immortality or my invincibility it's something deeper than that uh it's and more than that it has nothing to do with any kind of magic you know uh faith isn't it doesn't work like that i know i will die if i fall off of the cliff but that won't make, make me believe in god any less that you know death is as much a part of life it's not an aberration so one of the major arguments that atheists make uh for their atheism is that and I, that's actually something what uh that's actually the reason why I, this 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 chapter is so so you know it's just such a powerful chapter is because this this character who is made up this story i ivan he is an atheist and uh, one of the reasons that he's an atheist is because he believes that human suffering and i and not just human suffering um not just death but things like torture or um humiliation or any kind of and mm. sorry i'm sorry any kind of unnecessary pain that humans cause to other human beings if they are as much a part of god's creation as all things that are beautiful then god is not as benign as we would think he is and then why should i believe in such a cruel creature so that is this is actually a very powerful argument and it's very difficult to reckon with it's very difficult to argue against and the hero of the book alyosha even he can't argue against that you know he's not much of an intellectual he he understands his brother's atheism but it doesn't shake his faith it makes him question his faith but it doesn't shake it and the best answer i've got to that is um to uh, to ivan's great question is uh, in rabindranath tagore's um book called sadhna which i mention every single time i do any any kind of book review so in sadhna tagore basically talks about how and you'll understand why i'm mentioning sadhna because it has a lot to do with what i all the gibberish that i said about this chapter before 
चीज़ आई रियली होप पीपल आर फॉलोइंग एंड एनी वे सो बेसिकली साधना इन साधना टे गो टॉक्स अबाउट हाउ बिकॉज गॉड हैज गिवन मैन सो देर इज दिस लाइन इन द बुक वेयर टे गो राइट्स दैट गॉड रेन सुप्रीम एवरीवेयर एक्सेप्ट इन द ह्यूमन हार्ट विच बेसिकली ट्रांसलेट्स टू द आइडिया ऑफ फ्री विल एंड द फैक्ट दैट मैन हैज़ अ चॉइस दैट दे गेट टू चूज वेदर दे वॉन्ट टू फॉलो द पाथ ऑफ गॉड और दे वॉन्ट टू फॉल्स देर ओन एंड ऑल द सफरिंग एंड पेन एंड आई मीन अननेसेसरी सफरिंग सो इफ यू हैव टू डिवाइड सफरिंग इन टू ट्रेजडी एंड ईवल नेसेसरी एंड अननेसेसरी सो ट्रेजडी इज सिंपली डेथ यू नो इट हैपन्स टू एवरी वन इट्स लाइक अ कॉन्ट्रैक्ट वी साइन वेन वी वी डोंट साइन बट इट्स इट्स लाइक वी कम इन टू दिस वर्ल्ड विद दिस नॉलेज दैट वी आर गोइंग टू डाई यू नो दैट समथिंग इट्स दैट्स अन अवॉइडेबल बट then there's the unnecessary avoidable suffering which is what human beings human beings do to each other which is you know all kinds of evil all kinds of you know just murder theft i don't know i don't want to get into it but so sadhana mein uh, tagore basically says that the fact that god gives us a choice uh, whether to follow in his footsteps or follow the path that uh, is righteous or um is true or one of love is a choice that a human being has to make and if he chooses otherwise then all the de- all the destruction all the torture and terror that we see in the world that cannot be attributed to god it which isn't to deny the role in the fact that god has created us but it is to deny the role of god in the destiny that man chooses for himself so it is to say that yes there are some things that are in our control and there are many many things that are not and to the degree that we have some control in our lives this is one major major um uh, sort of area of contemplation for a human being you know that 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 is the sort of genesis for all metaphysical questions such as you know who am i what is my purpose in life what am i doing here and you know most people either not most people people either have a choice in you know finding the purpose in love and others just fall into despair and you know then tend to nihilism so okay i don't know what again this was a long tangent but um i basically what i was saying was that yes the answer to ivan's question the answer to ivan's question is that the ultimate every man comes with his destiny true but he also has a choice he also has a role to play in where where his life takes him you know that one can't say that we are ch- the children of god and so god has you know he has created people like hitler or mussolini or whoever it is to say that these people came with certain um what is the word that you see we are all uh, when we are as human beings and this is the way i conceive the world the fact that we are god like we are made in the image of god means that we have the capacity to reach and understand and pursue these ideals but because we aren't god we will never be those ideals and in order to reconcile with the fact that that will never be our destiny one needs to have immense courage and immense faith that it's uh that life is still worth living that it isn't in the per, in the in the conquest it isn't in the final destination but rather in the journey that we find our meaning and our purpose so to a person like ivan he his mind is focused so much on the things that he cannot control on things that have you know they 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 don't have rational explanations they can only be understood in a metaphysical in a you know spiritual in through the spiritual lens through the through that in that realm 
because he uses his rational mind to understand that world he he does himself in um the so he is probably my, the most interesting character in the book even more so than dimitri to me i mean uh, i am uh, to me uh, <laughs> it's difficult to have this conversation with a, an audience that i'm assuming don't know the book or haven't read the book that i'll try but with me for, with ivan i'm always so interested in how he's going to what he's really thinking how much does he really understand and we and by understand i don't mean understand but how much does he how much is his uh, how open is he to the idea of the transcendental because he is so opposed to it as you can see from whatever little i've read for you and whatever i've told about it that he is so his mind is so critical of um the idea of perfection and beauty and love that he destroys himself and yet there is so towards the end of the book ivan meets his shadow self his devil who basically like calls him out and says you have made up these stories because you secretly want to be um, you know a believer you secretly want to be like your brother alyosha you secretly want to have faith and maybe you do but it's because your faith just isn't as strong as your mind is you're more good at destroying whatever you know whatever you have that roots you that you are the cause for you know the murder of your father let's say not let's say that's the story i mean but i'm not giving anything away that's already written in the summaries okay so don't call me out on that i'm not spoiling the book for you that's right there in the summary so um i'm not going to get into the death of the father but what i basically want to talk about is how much does a nihilist how much is a nihilist a believer because um nihilists and atheists tend to be the ones who have contemplated a lot about god although through a misplaced faculty through a through a through a through through their brain which is you know the wrong way to conceive god but they 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 are the ones who have who truly understand what it's like to suffer to be you know one of god's favorites and um, you can think of all all these characters like satan or lucifer or mephistopheles all the devils that we've read about in these mythologies and these you know these great books all of them as the child who secretly wanted god's love but just was never good enough cain and abel may say who is it abel was it abel cain cain kills abel right yeah cain all these people who were just not good enough for god and those are the people that this this priest this clergyman claims to have you know sheltered that there are he basically says that you know you have chosen and hand picked your favorites and what about the rest of them where do they go so they need a place to stay you know so we've given them that place and now you come back to earth and you undo all the work we've done and you give them hope and you make them suffer again no please leave or i will kill or we will hang you will execute you he doesn't say please leave i mean he's not as polite but that's his point and i hope you understand where i'm going with this but this is so fascinating it's just so damn fascinating because like i said through to it even t- until the end i wasn't sure how much so let's say that Im- ivan was an instrument to murder but he never got caught because uh because like the let's how do i put it you know there are sometimes you coincidentally become caught in someone else's evil plan and you you're not guilty because you did something but you're guilty for your indifference so ivan 
is that man he is guilty because he did nothing and there is a mention of him understanding that he had a role to play in order to save his father and he abjugates that role he abjugates the responsibility and he calls himself a scoundrel for it but then further into the book he you know he when he's having a he confronts the man who you know um sort of uh, who gave him the he warned him about his impending you know about his father's murder let's say the, just the fact that his father is going to die when he confronts the man and he says why do you think i killed him the man says because i told you he was going to die i told you to be close by so i can we can save him so you can save him but you chose to leave your father abandon him and very interestingly early on into the book the father so let's let's not uh, it's so difficult for me to have this conversation because i'm going all over the place but um the father his father his father is a very depraved man he is you know he's not he's not a very well liked man he's he he's a liar he's a cheat he you know, has never loved his children he uses them etc etc so he so one he has he has had a public a very public tumultuous relationship with one of his sons so he has three sons um first is dimitri who is the oldest the second is ivan and the third is alyosha so dimitri has very openly threatened his father and said that you have robbed me of my you know of my inheritance and now you are also taking away the woman of my the love of my life so basically he, this woman kind of traps these men both of them and she kind of pits them against each other so and despite the fact that dimitri makes these death threat these death threats and he physically assaults his father on an occasion his father says that sometime somewhere in the book somewhere in the beginning before he's killed he says that i'm more afraid of ivan than i am of dimitri and that's such a telling statement because it tells you the that the power of uh indifference not the power the um damage that indifference does is far more than that of hate because hate is still an active emotion but indifference is no emotion at all it doesn't go either way it's like you're on the you're not even on the fence you're 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 not and that's something that ivan always says he says that i don't have time for meta- metaphysical questioning it's it's a waste of my time so he is a man who doesn't who very consciously chooses not to um not to experience life at a level deeper than his intellect at a deeper level at a level deeper than what is than the material elements of life and anybody who you know understands life even to the tiniest extent understands that life isn't it's the material elements of life far for our the the spiritual or the transcendental or the spirit or the the what's the word this the the internal life of a human being is far far more it's weightier it's more important than their exteriors although obviously there's also the belief that your you know that materialism does matter but only to one extent it isn't to say that it doesn't matter at all that we should reject all materiality but it is to say that we need to understand its proper place in the in in the human condition you know and so ivan has got that pri- his priority is all wrong he's got his sights set on the wrong goal and that's that's what interests that's what interests me about this character because i never fully find an answer to whether he was always conscious of what uh he was doing or whether uh he sort of just decided very early on that i don't have time for this because there are moments where he understand you can see that he's so tortured by despair and i don't believe that a man who doesn't feel love can feel despair you know a man with an easy conscience like people who are psychopaths like they don't feel anything 
they're emotionally quite dead so i believe that the fact that he feels all those emotions means that he is alive somewhere but he has chosen a deadened existence and we never fully understand why he did that you know like when you read crime and punishment you understand why raskolnikov is the way he is you know he has a family background he has motive blah 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 however with ivan it's very different like with dimitri i understand why he is the way he is actually that's that's the interesting thing apart from dimitri i never quite understood how is it that ivan and alyosha were who they were so alyosha by the way i said like i'm <laughs> reading the book backwards for you but anyways alyosha is a he's a monk so born in a family of such depraved men the fact that he turned to the monastery is is almost comical it's ironic it's shocking but he is the most loved and he is loved by all he is shown to be the reason that he is the hero in the book is because whoever he interacts with they sort of they become their best selves for him if not transform completely you know so i never quite understood why ivan and alyosha turned out the way they did almost like dimitri made sense to me as a character i understood why he hated his father why he turned towards you know sex and drugs and you know alcohol and whatever you know for me he was like the true son of the karamazov of of his father fyodor Kar- pavlovich sorry i'm not good with russian surnames but to me he makes sense like as a character rationally he makes sense but Ivan and Alyosha are so mysterious it's like you don't understand why they are the way they are and i think to some degree Alyosha is still a very rounded character you know he's a he's even if i don't know how he somehow escaped this life of you know just debauchery at least he's consistent you know there's some consistency to Alyosha there is there is so the the beauty of aryosha is that he's not a stock character he isn't just good you know he does have internal contemplate like internal conflicts he's constantly thinking it's it's just he is very clearly turned towards the right and the righteous and the true but with ivan he is just such a mystery to me because you know he he is a very complex character and the the only the mention he is um after his confrontation with his shadow with the side of him that tells him that your atheism comes from your deep sorrow and your deep you know love to be your your deep uh, what's the word longing to be loved by you know someone like alyosha to be worthy of god to be somebody who can and does secretly believe in god um after that his character kind of fades into the background you know he kind of becomes a non entity and that's that's the reason why this book i wanted to talk about this book because at to some degree it is one of the best one of the best for sure i think to me the second best book would probably be east of eden by s john steinbeck um but this book is a very the reason that i i i'm not able to say that i loved it you know with, with everything i had the way i am able to say about east of eden is because i felt as if that i feel like certain characters didn't get um they didn't get their due you know like there were characters and i think mainly it was ivan i didn't understand where he sort of went i think for me he should have been the final character or the final voice in the book but it continues to be alyosha you know and the book kind of ends on a very i feel like a trivial not a trivial event but trivial to the storyline um and i i don't you know and that wasn't the case with crime and punishment crime and punishment ended on a very like in a very what's the word on a it was very um, like you not didn't see what was what was going to happen come until it came you know but with this book i felt as if 
you know that it need that it needed a little bit more i don't know what it was but for me like ivan continued to remain a mystery like i i wanted to know what happened when he because what happens is that oh god i should should i give this away i feel like i shouldn't give it away it's going to ruin the book but basically that his character is just shown to be on his deathbed you know and there's nothing said about him you know and the last line of the book is i guess something like long live karamazov or something like that like some celebration of the karamaz karamazov karamazov the karamazov clan but it this book has so many just astounding passages things that i can't believe exist you know these thoughts and these ideas and these combination of words and stories these are phenomenal but i feel like as a story itself i think as as a philosophical discussion as a a a, a, a contemplation on the metaphysical substructure of the world or you know when it it's it's, it's the it's a fantastic book to think about but i feel as if as a story as you know somebody who who i it, it didn't do it, it didn't do it for me you know i i felt disappointed by the ending not just the ending but like whatever leads up to it i think it is in the epilogue um what i loved about it is that what i love about dostoevsky from the two novels that i've read and that's something peterson did one did he did sort of he to he, whatever i've because i mean i picked up dostoevsky because of peterson so one of the things he always says that is very uh, that is exceptional about his writing is that he never makes black and white characters that he always shows characters in conflict their in their conscience is constantly you know flitting between right and wrong and they're constantly torn by you know mm, torn by the righteousness of their actions and that he never strawmans any uh, side of a philosophical debate like even if you read dostoevsky you will have a lot of respect for him because the way he has chalked out um, ivan's idea of god or godlessness or whatever and other characters who are not exactly good or whatever who who you know choose the choose a life of debauchery or whatever um the way he represents them and their beliefs it's not it's not a uh, simplistic he doesn't make any reductionist arguments he doesn't pass any judgment on them he just writes them you know he writes them as they are and he writes them the best part about this book is that because alyosha is the hero because he is the uh heart of the book and i think maybe this is constant in dostoevsky's writing i don't know because i've only read these two books but because the central character like i believe the crime in crime and punishment the central character was not raskolnikov it was sonia because she was the heart of the book i think because the central characters in his book are so compassionate they are god himself you know uh that the book is um it 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 is you know entrenched with some compassion and forgiveness for all the misdeeds and wrong doings and it is full of second chances it's full of redemption that no character has an ultimate you know they won't ultimately you know even if they are in siberia that doesn't really mean that they're cast off completely from the eyes of god that they still let god still is looking out for them um so that's what i love about him that he doesn't write even if he's writing about a despairing character he never so far from the two books i've read it's a it's a pattern he never he never shows that that's who they truly are and he always um sorry the insinuation is always that their truth lies underneath all the all the intellectual bullshit they fed themselves and it lies in love in faith in compassion in you know mercy and that they're all capable of it but they've just made the wrong choices and have become hardened men you know and it's just but it's never too late to change that's that's like a running theme in these two books but with ivan i felt as if 
I don't know. I wasn't sure if he was truly redeemed. I feel like he falls into this kind of madness where he believes that you know he you know he has to right his wrongs but what he what 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 the way i understand his trajectory the trajectory of his character is that he is perceived to be or maybe this is what oh my god so you know there are two other stories or one other story at least there was one story i think only yeah there there is a story in this book early on in this book uh uh it's written from the perspective of a monk who is alyosha's let's say mentor for lack of a better word although he's called an elder but to sort of contextualize what it means to be an elder in a monastery it means like you're kind of a mentor so uh he was basically in at his deathbed um alyosha records his life and so father zosima that's his name he talks about this man that he met when he was very young and uh, on his journey towards being a monk he meets this man who um tells him that he has been living with the guilt of committing a murder for 14 years and he's known as this great philanthropist and um, you know perceived to be a great man in the society and he wants to you know confess to the crime that he committed and when he finally confesses um a he falls ill and eventually dies soon after and b nobody believes him because they're like oh no he he's just mad he just got caught up with his disease his illness and his illness made him say crazy things and i feel like i feel like that's kind of what maybe this was dostoevsky's way of showing how what guilt does to you you know that it makes you like physically sick and if you are known for for something if you if you have a reputation in the society that is somewhat commendable that perhaps the guilt that you confess to will never you know you will never be what what's the word you will never be, you won't be given a chance to repent except spiritually which is more important but still um and that's kind of what happens to ivan oh my god i don't know if that's really what the point of that story was was it like a like a prophetic element to what will happen to ivan because that's what happened to ivan that's exactly what happened to ivan although ivan didn't commit a murder like i said he was an accessory to a crime his indifference was his crime and he was known as his great intellectual you know and by the time he confesses to his role in the murder nobody really believes him he he's he falls to a delirium by that time and so when he makes his confession um people don't take it very seriously because they're like oh that's the illness speaking that's not the man speaking and so you know although he has made he's made peace or some or he's at least said his peace he said his truth but he has physically suffered for having it you know of like letting it churn and uh, the fact that he never gets he, there is a somebody else gets to pay for a crime that he believes he committed or at least had a large role to play in committing um that's what you know um eventually leads him to his deathbed that's exactly what happened to the other man oh my god oh my god It's so weird that i'm having this moment on video because i didn't even think of that but i mean i think that's the only answer i have to the sort of incompleteness i've felt that ivan's character uh the incom- like the sketching of this character they felt felt incomplete perhaps this was what it was perhaps that's why the dostoevsky didn't complete his character because he felt that that story did it and that the reader is supposed to go back to that story and understand that ivan was no different from that man in in some ways right that makes sense but still you know this this book i feel like it had a lot of characters whose whose role i didn't understand so the book ends on a funeral of two of this child who dies of some disease um and 
there is another child much like ivan very clever very self you know very self uh, what's the word like he he's very arrogant he's very he knows he can influence people and he often uses it to control them and get them to do what he wants he's a child and uh, somehow he realizes that you know uh, words and the intellect aren't what makes a man great and that's because of alyosha so i mean so i never really understood the relevance of putting this character in the story because the way i was thinking about it was i mean i guess that's what makes me kind of a modern reader and writer and you know whatever because some the, the way most modern books are written is you know chisel out whatever is unnecessary like you don't have to say more than you know if like the, if the story is about this then just keep the elements that tell that story and ex- erase everything else but i guess in classic classic novels in like these kind of books you know it's not about um it's not about the chiseled piece it's morely it's it's about it's more uh, what's the word it's it's not there is some kind of a uh, randomness to it there is that oh i believe that this character had something to say i don't know what it was i don't know how can I, how how basically that there is no one storyline is what i mean to say and i would and i'd say that that's the same from for crime and punishment the fact that i believe that sonia was the heart of the book uh tells you that you know uh, there isn't really one story going on there are many stories within that story and outside that story that are equally important and that's something that oscar because i felt that in crime and punishment i got like when when we see that raskolnikov is redeemed i feel like that was a like sort of that came together that story came together for me but with this story i felt like it didn't come together as well and especially because like i said the characters that i believe needed some more you know meat i felt that they didn't get it and then there were other characters which were introduced which i didn't whose significance i didn't understand to what i think the story line is but then perhaps it is about letting go of this idea of a story line and understanding it as like a like you know the playing out of the human drama and uh, allowing whoever comes in to come and go and go as they please because i know there was this one other scene in the book where the night when uh, i don't want to get into it is very boring that was the first time i felt bored in this novel i was like why am i reading about this i don't find its relevance or it it is just very boring as a boring scene but i mean that's the way i justified it that the point was not to make it interesting the point was not to make it you know crisp or to make it you know punchy it was about just it was just it is the way life is you know life is monotonous sometimes it is random sometimes sometimes you meet people who you never meet again who you may not even think about again or who you may think about 20 years later you know randomly and who you have no way of contacting ever again you know that's that's life and i feel like perhaps that was what the novel was really about that that was the beauty of the novel that it um of both novels i guess both crime and punishment and the brothers karamazov that it imitates life it imitates the beauty the conflicts the entanglements the you know not any the you know it imitates life very well <laughs> i don't know if that was dostoevsky's goal but i mean he does a good job in that man and i have been speaking for one hour i was going to make a 20 minute video and i was like oh yeah i'm just going to talk about this one thing and i ended up talking for one hour i don't know how much i'm going to reduce this down to after editing but um yeah i i just wanted to talk about this novel because it really left an impact on me and it really so because i have been think i have been engaged in philosophical discussions for a while now it's been a very it's been it it really sort of added to it it added a lot of i'm so sorry for my dog by the way it added a lot of um it gave me a lot of food for thought basically and uh, like it's definitely one of those novels that i will be going back to 
or at least cert- certain excerpts from it i'll certainly be going back to them because they have um there is something about them man it's i can't i i don't think i have words the, the <laughs> Yeah please spare me I don't I don't have words I don't have words Um yeah I guess the lessons of this novel what I no maybe not the lessons but whatever stuff that made me think Yeah okay why am I talking I think I should stop talking Okay hopefully you liked this and you were able to follow my thought uh like I said this was an unplanned video I think I said that um which is why it was so scattered and um yeah i don't know if i'm going to keep it like that or i'm going to edit things i'm really not a fan of editing so that's probably not going to happen but yeah thanks for watching